Hello everyone, my name is Mike Evans and I'm part of the Global Transport Leadership in Arup. Uh, on behalf of Arup and our panel, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar today. Um, today's event was inspired by two main factors. The first being that 2021 has been designated the Year of Rail by the European Commission. The Commission wants to shine a light on what is one of the most sustainable, innovative and safest transport modes we have. Rail also has a huge role to play in the global move towards sustainable and smart mobility. As someone who works across both the rail and roads or street sectors, I'm interested in how we deliver rail travel that is more convenient than car travel. And innovative thinking in stations is an important part of that movement to encourage passengers out of their cars. Rail can help propel Europe towards net zero. My colleague Nile is going to share an overview of our future stations report. We already know the transformative potential railways have on social and economic well-being within and between our cities. Rail is a catalyst for both economic growth and local regeneration, and our stations have an important role, some might even say a starring role to play in that. A well-designed station become, can become a symbol for a city, attracting people and encouraging travellers to move away from fossil fuel-based travel options. I had the pleasure of discussing some of this and more with our panel last week, and I know we're in for a real treat this morning. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Nile, who will talk us through the highlights from our future stations report. Thank you very much, Mike, um, and good morning to everyone. So I'm just going to go through um, the future stations report that our um, foresight and innovation group in Europe have done, um, collected all the ideas from a lot of people around the world in Europe and outside. So this report explores, you know, the, the trends that are shaping, you know, in, around new and existing assets, you know, and, and it's sort of focusing on on large inner city transport interchanges that you know combine the long distance and the last mile <clears throat> mobility um, and the mixed use of commercial uh, offerings. But all these lessons can actually be transformed into a station of any scale. So report explores what it may mean to deliver value um, and what a good return on investment uh, in the future and um, with the change of um, the Green Deal in Europe, uh, the sustainable future, you know, the COVID things have changed quite a lot in these things and the report is still, you know, uh, um, coming up with, you know, leads and ideas for that. And then, you know, the report actually proposes principles that we should consider for the use of the experience, the operation and the design of stations, you know, for our so if we take the next slide. <clears throat> so we sort of highlighted six princip principles that could make the biggest impact on delivering um, people first, low carbon mobility and station. So next one. So station boundaries, you know, it should be proper um, to support greater access and use. And that means that in the old days, the station was sort of a thing where you had one door to get in. And the idea and the trend is that it should be a lot more open. It should be a lot more people are just, you know, meandering through. And that means because of the technology, the digital technology ticketing, you know, a lot of things will be different. I will do use apps that will lead me through the station. If it's a live station, I will get, you know, real time uh, information about when, where's my train leaving from and what time. And that means that it's a lot easier that that station becomes a part of the city and it's just an interchange and all this will reduce operating costs and it will improve sustainability that we can actually operate it a lot more efficient with the digital. Next one, please. So how can we actually blur that thing that when you're in a station, when you're outside the station, so instead of having that sort of, you know, gate, um, the trend is that it will open up and we will have a lot of people in, in what we call our stations in the future who will never ever take a train. They will do other things, they'll do shopping, they will maybe go to the DP, they'll go to the public library, you know, all these variety of amenities that we could have in here, you know, from, you know, public service uh, things, but also private and and other things that is sort of getting people into that thing called community, which is maybe what a station is in the future. It's more about the community. How is that, you know, almost a community center? And by the way, you can actually take a train. You could also say that the it's so open that the platform is actually just another plaza in the city. Next one. So 
how can we actually integrate all these things that is happening when you leave your train on the platform or when you arrive to the station? So we have to think about the complete journey <clears throat> from end to end. And there's a lot of things we have to incorporate. In the old days, it was easy. You just took a, a you know, it came with a long distance train. You could either take, you know, a local metro train or there was a bus. But now there's a lot of other things that we have to incorporate into this so we can actually have this low carbon transport all the way from end to end. And that means that it has to be uh, a lot more flexible to get uh, e-scooters, bicycles, you know, shared autonomous vehicles. Uh, and it's not that you have to walk hundreds of meters to get to this. No, it should actually all be embedded in the same journey. So it's easy to take, easy to handle with your digital um, uh, booking system and everything. And that means that it's, it's not an obstacle on my journey that I have to take my scooter or I have to take a car to go to a meeting out in town when I arrive with my train. Next one, please. <clears throat> So excellent user experience should be universal. And, and I always thought as an architect, it's quite funny that, you know, a lot of the people who are designing spaces are, uh, are engineers uh, with um, not very much knowledge about how people actually behave. And stations are all about spaces. It's all about wayfinding. It's all about feeling safe. And how do we do that? We can actually have station spaces that you feel safe in uh, all times of day, but also now we actually have this digital overlay that actually sort of combine the analog world with the digital work. And if it's actually done in the right way, if, if the user interface is not done rightly, then we have an infrastructure that is actually really helping our passengers and our guests to get onto the train as smart as possible, but also to navigate the stations, but also to navigate, you know, all the way from their home to their end point. Take the next one. So when we have these stations, some of them is actually quite large stations. Other ones are small, that has to, you know, how do we enlarge them? How do we actually re-transform them? And actually what we can do with uh, a digital overlay is that we know exactly where people are. We know how they use. We know what the 24-7 rhythm of a station is. And that means that we can equip things with sensors so we can actually use the space in a lot more, in a smarter way and, you know, utilize all the spaces in there so it actually is uh, efficient uh, for energy use but also efficient for actually running the maintenance uh, of all the parts in the railway that we all know there's uh, thousands of parts that has to be looked after but that also means that we know where we have people we know when we have the people and we know how to operate and where we can operate you know why we have this data overlay next one so Station benefits will be environmental and social, not just economic. And I think, yes, to me, it's very clear and it's very clear to see that now a lot of us have changed pattern in how we work. So what is the station value that actually before was just the station? It's a lot more. And rail is now going to deliver more um, passengers. Uh, if you look at all countries, you know, it, it they're raised of passengers. And that means that we have to deliver them in partnership, you know, across countries, across cities, across municipalities. And to get that thing that, you know, we actually drive, uh, the, the, the train is the one that drives that change. But of course, everybody else has to put in. And where can we use the things that, you know, like in London, you know, there's an enormous uh, uh, waste heat from, from some of the tube lines. How can we use that, you know, to heat other things? How can we inclusively look at this and recognize and emphasize how rail actually can be that environmental benefit uh, that we haven't seen for years and also make it very um, uh, trendy to take a train as if you're a business person. Next slide, please. So these are some of the um, trends that we sort of collected in a round circle, so it's easier to read. But, you know, it's the economy, it's the technology, it's the social, the political and the environment. And it's not just a one. If we do one, it's not enough. We have to do all of them and we have to do them in, in you know, they have to into 
wine between each other to find out how if you do one what happens to the other one and also of course it's cultural and locally based so there will be differences if you do it in um, southern europe northern europe or whatever you are in the world next one please so what will our stations look like in the future and i think it's not about the architecture, it's actually about the outcome that the station gives. So that's what we're looking at. It's not the architecture that has a curved roof or glass roof or whatever. No, it's what outcome do they actually give and what what is the city around it? How is it fitting into the urban scale? Next one, please. So it has to be a human sensor. It's all about the passengers. It's all about the people in the city. So it's about these a shift that we have right now that now we have advanced technology there's a demographic issue we have a socio-economic shift and that means that we have to have new business models and we have to have new strategies so we can you know, sort of blur that division between the physical and the digital but also between private and public and how can we actually make that building a part of the urban landscape next one so these are just, you know, the way in finding is about having green spaces. It's about place making. It's about, you know, how do we get skylights so we can actually have daylight on platforms. So we take these things out to make it a more, you know, a space that people can navigate in. So it's not just, you know, uh, convoluted spaces that we see in a lot of uh, stations today. And because we have to, you know, upscale the assets, we can actually deal with that now. Next one. So, what is it for kind of technology we should use? Uh, take the next one and see. So, you know, it's about centering the environment. What is the environment out there? You know, is it a nice environment? And with the 5G connectivity, we can do a lot of things and we can actually handle a lot of data. And for the operation, we will have digital twins, so we know exactly what's going on. We can actually probably monitor every room in a station and find out what's going on. And then we have the mobility as a service. You know, when I arrive at my station, either I come on a scooter on a, or an electrical car, how do I get rid of it? Where do I place it? How do I easy access my next uh, mode of transport? And there will be no ticketing. You know, I'm still doing a lot of projects that will open in 10 years where we still have tickets. And, you know, it will not, it will happen, you know, in a digital uh, meaningful. And that means that we can, we can actually have people flowing around in a completely different way. Next one. So how do we actually diversify that spatial issue and the facilities we have, you know? So because a lot of these stations are placed smack in the center of the city, that means, you know, it's a, it's a prime location for a lot of things. And take next one. So what we are talking about is that it's not just about, you know, everybody's talking about um, transported oriented development, you know, it's all about offices, it's all about, you know, getting people in. Uh, but there's another thing, and that's what I call, you know, transport oriented communities. What is, how do we actually invest in communities in these things? Because we can see the stations that, that are really popular, it's actually the one who have reached out to the community, who have housing close by, who are, you know, maybe have, you know, parts of it can change over time very easily that do we have childcare there do we have shopping do we have our gps you know do we have activities that actually is good for your health and well-being you know and here we said you know as a climbing wall how can we actually integrate all these things next one please and that means that seemingly integration of modes and services are so um, important next one so that means that how, when I arrive, how do I get there? How do I actually change mode of system? How do I actually access the station? Or is the station actually the public uh, urban square? Um, how do I actually walk um, around this area? How do I sort of, you know, have this micro mobility and flexible curves and everything that will uh, help me doing what I should do next on this? So it's also, of course, about sustainability and resilience. And um, as a transit has a considerable role to play in this uh, sustainable future to get people from their cars into a public transport. And that means that, you know, 
how do we actually make the stations so they are resilient to the storm water? You know, how do we integrate green spaces? How do we you know integrate the last mile connectivity and all these things I talked about? You know, and the trains will be hydrogen run on hydrogen. So all these new things come from both sides, both you know can say from the outside into the station, but also from the station and outside into the public. So it's a lot more. Um, part of that city and delivering all the goods it can do for a sustainable future. Next one. <clears throat> and then urban generation and, and social mobility is really how can we actually have inclusive and sustainable growth and stimulate development of mixed use uh, communities around it. Uh, you know, how do we connect to hubs and how do we have affordable housing? You know, so station is the part of that. Um, center of growth where we have all these things. So it will be uh, not a station as we see it, but it's a part of that urban fabric where people are living, uh, working, uh, and all sorts of people, not just a very monocultural um, kind, but it's actually is a diverse group of people that are looking for the outcomes. Next one. And then just a very short division for the station of the future. Um, next one. So no, it's about ticket base and barrelless free. We will have digital sprints so we can run them faster. I mean, we can actually run, you know, operations more precise. Inclusive wayfinding, you know, how can actually digital and the space help you? That's about space, spaces for well-being. You know, is that place where you can sit and just almost, you know, meditate or is there an activity space, you know, and how can these sort of stations be flexible over time also so they can actually change over time uh, depending on the needs. And then, of course, how can we actually <clears throat> have that human touch, but also the automation and the personal assistance that is given to you digitally and in and by human being. And then we talking about the integrated micro mobility that will help us, you know, get from whatever platform to wherever we're going to reach out in the in the city. And how can we actually do all that in the most sustainable way and actually um, support um, renewable and how can we chart these things around them. And with that, I think I will uh, uh, hand over to Lane Duty. Uh, Lane leads the integrated um, <coughs> citizen planning network in Europe, and she will be the moderator for the panel discussion. So over to you, Lane. Thanks, Nilla, and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to have the um, opportunity to moderate this uh, fantastic panel. Um, this morning. So we're going to have a discussion for about um, half an hour, 35 minutes. Um, and I'm going to ask the panelists or distinguished panelists um, to introduce themselves and perhaps say a few words about what rail and stations means to them in their roles. Um, and I'll start with um, Peter, if you could just introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning. I'm the Deputy Mayor for Urban Planning, Housing and Environment um, here in Stuttgart. And as you know, we have an, a big project here. It's called Stuttgart 21. And it's a completely, completely new main station here and uh, also um, um, a new um, housing quarter. Um, and we are building completely uh, all, all the things around the main station into a new situation. So for us, it's a, it's a great change in inside the city because now uh, nearly 10 years um, of building site uh, are after us. Uh, and um, I hope uh, only four years to the end um, um, are left. So um, and we have also the discussion uh, what is uh, 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 what is the future of a station? Is it only a station or is it more? And it, it is more. That's great. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Jim, if you could um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your obviously your, your interest in rail. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Um, I suppose my interest in rail goes right back to the start of my career. Um, um, I'm currently the CEO of Air Northern Irish Rail, uh, and we operate all, as you will know, all the passenger and freight services across the Irish network. 
But I suppose personally, um, I've been in the industry all my life. Um, I started as an apprentice, an apprentice fitter, uh, back a bit longer than I'd care to admit. Uh, but I suppose, and I've come right through the organisation and I took over as CEO in um, May of 2018. I suppose my role really is to lead the management team and ensure the railway is operated and maintained in a manner that does prioritise the safety of passengers, and employees and indeed third parties, because we have a lot of third parties on our network and provide quality customer service uh, to all who use that network. Uh, I suppose, oh, having had a career that's been all in public transport, I have developed a, an understanding of the requirements to, to manage all as aspects of the business, uh, while working to the challenging targets that we now find ourselves with, uh, as we as we develop the, the public transport as a whole, and rail in particular, uh, with the current investments. But when we look at stations, Stations are about uh, transport hubs uh, and they are the transport hubs of the future. Uh, and I suppose we are currently have a big focus on transport orientated developments uh, and development station and station environs that attract people to those locations and create, uh, I suppose, destinations much more than, than just stations themselves. That's great. Thank you very much, Jim. And Vlaho, if I could come to you, please. Hi, good morning, everybody, <clears throat> and apologies for joining from um, the phone without a picture. Um, my name is Vlach Koyakovic. I'm a director of property and tourism team, which is based in London, working for a European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The bank is active over the last 30 years in around 40 countries uh, of Eastern Europe and North Africa. And one of our main activities in the team is actually focusing on the regeneration of the cities. This regeneration historically in Southeast Europe, especially, but also elsewhere in our countries of operation, has been around meeting and community places, which railway stations have historically developed into. Um, what we are trying to do is to help to create these new city centers or anchors in the new city centers, which are actually uh, railway stations, especially in this carbon neutral future where we believe that railway is uh, becoming more and more important. So I'll stop here. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, Nila, we, we all know Nila now from, from the presentation. So um, if we could, I guess the first question really um, is, a, is about, you know, the, the big theme of uh, the European Commission and the world at large around decarbonisation, um, which is a key theme, obviously, across all industries at the moment. And um, I guess I'd like to come to you first, maybe, Jim. Um, how can rail in general and stations in particular um, be catalysts for more sustainable transport? Um, I think the, the the big part that rail can play in sustainable transport uh, is in the, is in the move to I suppose to net zero uh, on, on, and looking at that we are looking predict particularly at the electrification of our fleet. Uh, we we traditionally have had a quite a diesel um, fleet. But we are moving uh, quite quickly to electrifying the network. Uh, we have a program running uh, in the Greater Dublin area, um, the Dark Plus, as it's known, that will see us um, triple the electrified area in, in, in the network uh, and uh, uh, double the capacity of that network. So that's one of the, one of the big things from the, the, the decarbonisation point of view. Uh, I suppose the other thing that helps with decarbonisation that doesn't uh, be as obvious from the word go is as we create a better environment for public transport, be it in stations uh, and in the services themselves, the migration of people from cars onto public transport uh, is, is, is a decarboniser in, in itself. Um, so uh, as, as we give a better service, uh, as that happens, um, then that contributes significantly. From the station perspective, it's about, and I think during the presentation we saw, uh, we saw about it being placemaking, and it's a word we have used before ourselves, that the station itself has become a destination for people, um, that they, they go there not just to, to get public transport, but maybe to meet people, um, and that, that whole integration with the, with the community around the station and developing the, the transport orientated developments around the station all contribute to the de decarbonisation agenda. So we have several projects running in that area, uh, two big ones at the moment near Houston Station in Dublin. We are we are looking at a major development there 
on a site by the station that we currently own of about 20 acres or so. Uh, and then on one of our regional cities in Limerick, we have a very, very big programme that we're working with the Land Development Agency uh, and some other state agencies to develop a site of almost 100 acres. Uh, and that's all about generating generating that area where people migrate to, uh, where people live, where people work, uh, and with the with this with the rail station as a transport hub within that, that we have a fully integrated transport system. So the more we integrate, the more we can we can look at the end to end journey. Traditionally, I suppose rail would have looked at just the rail element of it, but now we need to think about how people start their journey, how people finish their journey, and if we're to get decarbonisation really well we have to transition to that point that when people want to make a journey, they think about public transport first and how they can use, be it walk, cycle, bus, Lewis, tram, train, whatever combination they want to use, that they, they do that. Uh, and that's where we get real traction and decarbonisation. That's great. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, Peter, just to pick up on that point then about um, accessing public transport and the kind of integration of modes. Um, you know, from your experience, how can stations make it convenient and easy to access public transport and active travel? I mean, perhaps, you know, as Nila mentioned, other services, you know, what, what are the different ways that you've been thinking about this? Uh, we want to have the, the main station as a central hub for all the, the traffic forms. So, so you can change there from train to bus to bike or car sharing. And it's necessary that uh, this should be done very easily. So the, so the people just uh, put out their phones or, or something like that, tip uh, on one button and then they can change the traffic uh, system. So I think it's, it's very important that um, also uh, it should be uh, short ways to change. Um, it makes no sense if, if you go hundreds of meters to change the traffic um, uh, vehicle. The, the, this uh, normally um, leads uh, that people don't want to change. So, and it has to be attractive and it has to be safe because uh, normally in the evening times, uh, some people don't like to use the public transport because it's dark, ugly, uh, they feel not safe. Um, and this is also a, th a thing that we have to change because uh, it should uh, be a pleasure to use the stations. So um, I think this, this is um, very important. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Peter. Um, Vlaho, I guess um, you mentioned about the station as a kind of a key part of the regeneration of the city centre. Um, wh what, how do you you know, think about using this, the, the station as that kind of catalyst for regeneration. Um, and, and what is the role of the station then in terms of attracting people to use rail for work and leisure? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, on your point of decarbonisation, um, as a bank, we are investing around 11 billion euro a year in the countries where we operate. and. We are trying to align most of our projects with the Paris Agreement for 2015 in order to actually have these financing flows going with the low carbon and climate resilient pathways. And railway stations require private investment, a private investment that will create a hub, which is not going to only be interchange between transport, but also which is going to actually provide meeting spots and community places for people to exist, exist in terms of working environment, leisure environment, uh, sport environment and so on. And this is where we really see our chance. So we are working with a number of large master planners uh, in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, trying to create new post-COVID environment for the railway stations that have been actually neglected over the last 30 years in the countries where we operate. Uh, giving a couple of examples, uh, Croatia, for example, has three or four large cities where railway stations were developed during Austro-Hungary. At that point, they were at the uh, suburbs of the city. Today, they are right in the heart of the city. But the land around these railway stations uh, was left unused because it used to be a repair yard for the trains and uh, hectares and hectares of this land 
actually are sitting as the best property now, which is available for the urban development. So the way this urban development happens, and we are really trying to make it happen in a green, sustainable way where the decarbonization is going to be the ultimate goal for every investor that participates in these projects, is something which is going to create this railway station environment into a new hub for the city. So we are very excited about your report and about uh, EU Commission uh, calling this year uh, the year of the railways because we believe both in terms of property but also in terms of tourism when it comes to movements of people we are looking toward the transition from the air to rail as something which is really sustainable super thank you very much um nila did you want to come in on that point around um decarbonization and um the, i guess in particular the integration of the station um into the fabric but also the integration of the station with other modes like perhaps um the um uh mobility as a service how does the station play in in that in that sense yeah i i think yeah um Reading through uh, all the national um, railway uh, organizations' uh, future plans, they all see a growth. Uh, what they probably miss out a little bit is that, um, and COVID have changed that, uh, is that before we all wanted to go to the center, and then we had meetings in the center, and then we took the train back again. So um, me living in Berlin, I would take the train to Hamburg, have meetings in Hamburg, go back again, and vice versa. What is happening now is that I will actually maybe live in the periphery of Berlin, and that means that I'm not going to the city center. And when my meetings are starting, they will be, you know, on the periphery. So that means that it will not just going just be going to the city center, but also connecting all these ripples around the cities. And if we can do that in a smart way, whether it's with a bus, whether it's with a train, a metro train, or whatever then we can really decarbonize things because then there is no excuse to take your car right now for a lot of cities it's easy to go to the center but it's quite difficult to you know cross the city in a, in a way so i think if we can do that then then we really decarbonize and then i i know that um, rail is all about evolution it's not a revolution but maybe we should have a fast evolution because there is things that we could change very fast and that is the digital thing that so i can buy tickets easier so i can find my way around but also that i change my financial situation so i don't you know um why is it that a lot of times it's a chain that actually owns the coffee shop and the kiosk on the station delivering bad coffee you know not very good service and they're not a part of the community so i think all these things that is around the station have to be really embedded in the community so i see it as it's my coffee shop it's not you know the Danish state railway or the irs railway or the coffee shop it's my community's coffee shop and that's why i bond with them and they are allowed to have open until you know uh, midnight you know they can open on you know sundays and all these things so there is this life around it and depending on where the station is you can add you know is that tennis court is the swimming pool library so you have that 24 7 um livable station and livable city that um, then will be safe and nice to be in i i guess um Th there's kind of a, a question then about the sort of implementation of of that and you know how so i think what we're talking about is that stations are you know we recognize that stations are part of a much larger context you know that they're part of the city or the suburb or they're even the rural place where they are and so you then have a kind of a blurring of boundaries between the city and uh, and the the station or the the context the place where the station is and the station and and i guess um there's then a question about how you know the stakeholder management who was the, the leadership of that i mean peter i wonder if you could say a few words and i'll come to some of the other panelists to talk about that what who takes the leadership then when those kind of boundaries blur across the places and then also the transport modes you know how do you orchestrate that and make it all work together for the user oh 
No, yep. it works. You work. Um, yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, yo, we have uh, to discuss this with um, all the people um, in the city, um, and we discuss it also um, maybe with the Deutsche Bahn, who is the owner of the stations. And I agree that we uh, have to um, also um, get uh, better stations uh, in the suburbs. All the stations we have had to get much more better, because if we if we if we just only look on the main station then we, we don't get the cl climate change uh, or we, we get the climate change because because it's very necessary that that we think about all these stations are hubs and these hubs should be uh, very comfortable and uh, also uh, they have to be integrated in town. Today normally you have a, a big parking space in front of the station, uh, you have uh, the cabs, you have the bus stop, uh, maybe you have a restaurant not of good quality, um, uh, maybe a fast food and something like this. And this is not not a part of the town. It's it's normally a hole in the town because you just go there because you have to go there to to get on train or something. But it should be um, uh, uh, yeah, it, it should be. Uh, normal that I go to the station and there enjoy other things like culture, uh, not only the transportation, there should be a good restaurant and something like that. So so uh, it, it should be integrated in town. Also, I have to think about uh, how can I connect the different parts of the town around the station? Yeah, I have the tracks, but how can I cross these tracks and, and made it comfortable? not, uh, I think, dark and ugly and, and uh, something like that. So and uh, we here in Stuttgart dis discuss also not only the main station, but also some smaller station around uh, the town. How can it be better? We have one project that we have uh, put away the, the industrial area near the station and put their housings. And so we connected the small center of, of the suburb with uh, the station, but uh, with housing. So uh, past years ago, you go through this industrial area to the station and this was not very comfortable. Now you have uh, a new area with, with uh, some newer public spaces, with housing, uh, with also some facilities uh, in, in the ground floor and something like that. And so we have to change this so, so the, the stations has to be a part of the town and it should be a, 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 and it has to be a lot of quality. Not only that there are a lot of traffic uh, with, with trains, buses, uh, cabs, bikes, but it should be a, a, a lovely place. Let's say it, it should be a lovely place, a place um, we like to go. That's great. Thank you, Peter. And um, Jim, I, I, I might just come to you with um, a similar question. I mean, in terms of that kind of collaboration and, and leadership between all the different, I mean, it's a complicated picture, I guess, you know, particularly in cities, but even in, in, in suburbs and rural areas, you know, how do you, how do you do that stakeholder management and what is the leadership that needs to happen to make these great places? So I think that's what we're talking about. Um, yeah, I, I think yeah, I think planning the environment, and I think that's what Peter was, was kind of alluding to. Uh, for us, uh, as we look at it, it, it is about it is about planning the environment and having having the the, the key stations as destinations, um, which is which is key to I suppose getting the, getting bringing them to life and have them used as more than just a, a transport interchange. Um, and it, it's it's around trying to understand what the, the the public realm should be, what the building uses should be, uh, how they should in, how they should integrate. So for us, um, it, it's about working with key stakeholders and working with with planners, working with with county, you know, with city and county councils and their development plans, feeding into county development plans because transport is a is a slow burn. Uh, it, it's not something that you can change very very quickly. You have to have your forward planning right. Um, and, and it's part, I suppose, of the, the major facilities that go into any development. Historically, we may have done uh, developments and not thought 
exactly about how the how the transport infrastructure would work around the, around those uh, environments and, and, and new builds. But now I think we're starting to work more collaboratively uh, with, with the key agencies involved uh, and we're starting to look at what we can do uh, with the area around stations, which a lot of the time is in our own ownership because they were historically very, very big freight yards or there were very big maintenance depots around stations. It was the nature of how they were designed back in the last century. So that space is now there uh, and where possible can be freed up. Uh, and we, we look very closely at what we term transport orientated development. So obviously we, we, we look for that planning environment to be right. But we also look for it to have a bias towards transport. Uh, ultimately, we want people to migrate to public transport, and we want we look we look with stakeholders then as uh, that public realm space. How is it laid out? How do we improve the safety of, of, of you know for people moving around uh, late at night, early in the morning, whatever? Um, so so for us, it, it is about that integration of, of thought process. It is about the uh, the working with key stakeholders, working with uh, with county councils, city councils, with the various departments that are involved for that long term planning and laying out a, a roadmap that says, well, this is where we want to be in five, 10, 15 years time. Uh, and understanding that, I and mean, to that end, we have done a strategy within within our, within the Air Northern for out to 2027, and we're currently working on a strategy out to 2050 that that lays down the, the key cornerstones of how the transport should work, how we believe stations should work, uh, and how city and, and town planners can build transport in, in, into their planning, uh, and we get that integration. So I think it's it's a collaborative approach. It can never be but a collaborative approach. There are many stakeholders uh, involved. Um, we can't plan on our own, and we will, we would say city and county planners can't plan on their own. Uh, and we need to understand what are what are the key elements that will that will get people to migrate to public transport to do things that actually indirectly decarbonize. If we can get people into a mindset that they're not t thinking about decarbonizing, they're just thinking about what's efficient, what works best for them, and if that automatically is public transport, public realm space. You know, being able to live and work in the one environment, being able to socialise in the one environment, and if that's if that can be integrated with train with, with public transport and train stations, then all the better. That's when we're really uh, adding adding value to the process. That's great, thank you, Jim. Um, Vlaho, um, I guess you know, in terms of the work that you're doing in regenerating city centres, um, you also have to bring the sort of private sector investors with you. How do you? How do you see that kind of implementation of the vision um, in terms of orchestrating these stakeholders who are multiple? Yes, I think what um, Jim and Peter highlighted, collaborative approach uh, is is uh, is really the uh, driver, and, and it's it is the beginning at the end of the process. Um, but I have to highlight that master planning and design. How do we actually? take the long-term approach towards the stations as well as the area around it can make a success story or a failure story. <clears throat> we can see uh, King's Cross in London with Argent that took 20 years to develop completely changed the face of centre of London and became a desirable place not only to live but to eat, to study, to hang around uh, and also to exist in a way of feeling that you are in the urban environment but which is also high. The opposite of that I feel is a little bit if you go to Brussels MIDI which is confusing, the design is done in a wrong way, signage is done in a wrong way and actually you want to leave that station as soon as you can. So when we are looking to invest and we are bringing private investors with us we know that we need patient capital because the pre-development, the development of these sites is much longer than when you have a freestanding site. And as Jim and Peter pointed out, uh, transport is changing at a very slow pace because the changes are massive. So the private capital has to go with it. The, the private capital has to actually have patience for the modes of transport to reconfigure themselves in order for the rest of the sites to be developed. But once they are, these are the best sites that the city and the country can offer. And this is where there is a lot of interest from pension funds, from investment funds, from the banks such as ours to work into reconfiguring of the cities in a way by reconfiguring the city centers around the stations. That's great, thank you. And I just want to stay with you, Vlaho, to move on to a different topic around tourism. Um, you, you know, so 
I guess, you know, do you think that rail has a bigger role to play in enabling tourism? And and then secondly, what is what is the role of the station? Does the station need to offer different things to people who are going on their holidays than to, you know, the, the commuter or the the the, uh, the business traveler? Absolutely. I will, I will start with tourism and then go to business travel. What we saw over the last three years is a complete shift in tourism. First of all, uh, the destinations, which I would call them driving destinations, uh, have created last summer something called rage tourism, where people after the first wave of pandemic just had enough of sitting in home in the apartments with two or three children, and they decided to take the risk. But that taking the risk stopped with flying. So people stopped flying to tourism destinations and they were driving, driving to places such as Croatia, France, Italy, uh, Montenegro. Um, on the other hand, what we see is this summer, actually there is more and more people who are looking to public transport. Again, not planes per se, but there were new waves of uh, tourists coming by the train uh, where that was possible, especially in France and Italy, but also in places such as Southeast Europe. So I feel that by the improvement and through the improvement of the rail infrastructure and by providing amenities, actually people will slowly switch from car to trains where this train journey is not taking more than five or six hours. And I think this is where Europe needs to go. Uh, looking at it, uh, how we see today tourism in Morocco, in Egypt, even in Georgia, uh, they will require long term shifts and they will require a focus on the local and regional tourism of those countries. While we feel that Europe will actually stay for the years to come because of the health issues and because of the practical issues uh, within Europe. So there is a big chance for the railway infrastructure to benefit from it and to offer the alternative to alternatives to the car journeys that are now predominantly used as a mean of transport for going to tourism. Going back to business travel, business travel is going to take some time uh, to recover. Uh, we feel that actually conferences, meetings with all the investment that happened in the IT are actually not going to be immediately rebounding as the tourism is. Uh, but slowly, that will probably become a case. And in that sense, I feel that again within Europe, a railway is going to become a dominant means of transport and not uh, the flights. The flights are still going to face all sorts of uh, issues when it comes to testing, when it comes to uh, insecurity and inability to judge whether the airplane company, when you're checking your luggage, will ask you for three types of tests and you will have to prove actually the destination country is asking for something else. So there is a much more uncertainty than when it comes to the public transport, which is grounded. And again, this is where the railways stand a good chance to get some of the market share. Great, thank you. Um, Nila, just to come to you about um, digitalization is obviously a huge theme and you mentioned you talked a bit about that earlier. Um, you know, if, if we are having more capacity, um, rising capacity um, levels on the on the rail, you know, and more passengers, how do you think that digitalization can help with that and, and the, the experience around the station and into the city? I, I actually think that there's, there's, um, there's stations that has the capacity to take the extra. Um, and we can see that um, NS in the Netherlands, you know, are looking for increase of passengers, not by putting more trains or, or you know, uh, things in, but actually making the journey easier, seamless for their passengers and uh, redesigning the train so you can take your bike with you and all these things. That means they get the increase in that way. And that means that it that is run on a digital platform. So I, as a passenger, you know, can control my travels. And I also think, as Vlaho is saying, that when you go on a holiday, it would be really nice that I could drive five, six hours, then I could step out. You know, there's a hotel booked for me. You know, I can have an evening. You know, in whatever Paris, and the next morning I'll go to Marseille. You know, and that's the way I would I would travel. So there's this sort of more. Um, 
human way of traveling when we do uh, with public transport. And I think all that will be on digital platforms. And But also, I, I test a lot of these uh, apps. And I have to say, uh, 80% is failing, you know, uh, simple things. Because if you are nerd, you can find out. But, you know, we have, it's all kind of people who have to use these things. So it has to be very, very simple. I'm always saying that if you can manage your app and buying tickets with your thumb, then it's okay. If you need to, you know, read the book, it's not good enough. And, and I believe that that digital thing will also tell me that if I have a smaller station you know, in the outskirts or something that is, was in the outskirts is now actually in the city center, instead of building a new station building, how do we actually start taking that square where all the car, um, cars are parked, take the cars out, do something which maybe is, is, is a structure that can change over time so I can accommodate my people that come from, um, from the train. And that is all about changing the red line you know, we have the red line that, you know, uh, the state railway is, that's where I deliver my passenger, then um, the problem is the municipalities. That has to go away. And to do that, I think we have to sit down, uh, and a lot of you have talked about it, that with the partners around these stations and the one who are benefiting, the one who has to contribute to make it a success, actually finding out what are the wicked problems, what are the problems that is stopping things that, you know, and how can we deal with those? And I think if we could reframe these questions, then it can be a really success. And it's not huge investment. It's actually, you know, uh, slowly having a plan and slowly building it out uh, over the years. Um, and that will change cities. I know in Copenhagen, we just opened City Ring and now there's, I think, 600 meters to uh, public transport for anyone living in Copenhagen. And it's changed the city completely. Great, thank you, Nilla. Um, I'm going to ask um, all of you a kind of a, um, a in a way, a closing question, but it, it's, it's kind of picking up on your point about um, digitalization and um you know that changing people's changing patterns of work and changing patterns of uh, of travel in a way you know before the covid pandemic only um you know uh, i think it was four percent or five percent of people worked from home now it's over 40 percent um and you know a lot of people want to continue working from home having some kind of two to three day kind of hybrid existence um how do you think that might change i'll, I'll come to you um peter how do you think that might change you know the the future of rail and, and stations it I think the home office will not so change the, the the station, but it will change maybe the time we use the stations. Because I think um, um, if, if you have a lot of home office, the people don't uh, drive at nine o'clock in the morning um, into the town and uh, at four o'clock um, uh, they rent out, but they should also use uh, the stations um, all the time for all the traffics or all the ways they want to uh, use. So um, I think the, the home office will change the situations in the office areas because they get smaller, they, they will change. Uh, uh, the companies are, are thinking about to reduce uh, their office spaces. Um, but for the stations, I think we have to use of, of um, uh, not only of, of the traffic in the morning and in the evening because we have to bring their uh, life um, through all the, the day. So I think this is very important that the stations, uh, yes, they are mobility hubs, but maybe they are a part of the town to live, to get there, to eat, uh, to, to have culture there or meetings and something like that. And, and it's 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 much more than than only a traffic hub. So I think this is very important to, to have the, all the stations in the in the in the city, in the towns, uh, also in the suburbs. Not only the main station should be a, a nice and and, and uh, a great station, but also the sta all the stations in the suburbs. There there are yes like 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 marketplaces. Uh, you have there in, in you are in the, in the center. Sometimes all the stations are near the center, so this is a this is very a great effort that 
that you can drive into the center of the suburb or into the center of the town very easily. If you're thinking about if you if you if you I can go here in Stuttgart uh, to train, uh, I take the TGV to Paris and I'm I'm inside Paris. Uh, I walk five minutes uh, and I take the train to London and I'm also inside the city and not outside. If I take the plane, I have to go outside, take the plane, I arrive outside and then uh, I drive into the town. So I think this is a this is a, a very big issue that all the stations normally are near or in the center. And so we have to, to create there uh, a very quality place uh, to do all things, not only to, to drive or to, to take the train or, or to change from train to bike or something like that. That's great. Thank you, Peter. Um, Jim and Vlaho, if I could give you um, just a, a, a a minute each, perhaps, to say your say your uh, thoughts. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. I suppose. Look, short term, people will need more space on public transport. We 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 accept that. Um, just to travel, we need more space around them. But for us, I think it gives us the opportunity to grow capacity ahead of demand, possibly for the first time ever in the history of public transport, certainly in Ireland. Um, we are we are, in 2019. We were planning how we would deal with the peaks in advance of new fleets arriving. Now it's about getting ahead of that curve so that for the, the demand that will, that will inevitably come. Like, OK, 75, maybe 80 percent of the old customer base will return uh, as we will go into blended working and everybody will, will, will use blended working. But we do also need to plan, I think, for the migration of people from cars to public transport because uh, blended will be the way of the future. Uh, and I suppose combined with uh, migration to public transport and it'll be driven by our planning strategies that we've just discussed, the decarbonisation agenda and climate responsibility. Great, thank you, Jim. And Vlaho? Uh, maybe just the experience of um, our bank. We have 30 offices and the largest office with 2,000 people in London. Uh, what we gave uh, is the opportunity to all the employees to work from home or to come to the office at any point in the day. So this is what I think actually will benefit the railway infrastructure because what we saw before were the peak times in the morning and in the evening. Having this more flexibility of coming in and out to the meetings or spending part of your day in the office and part at home will spread out the actual times when people are taking the public transport, will reduce the congestion and from that perspective make, make much more pleasurable journeys. So I think COVID actually brought some positives as well with this combination of hybrid working. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. So I just want to thank all the panelists. I think it's been a fantastic discussion and I think it's really um, brought out the importance of wider wider thinking, both in terms of having a longer term view of what it is that you want to achieve with the station, but also the, the surrounding area and, and, you know, and the decarbonisation and regeneration and so on. Um, but also having um, having that longer term and also that wider view. So thank you very much to everyone. I really um, appreciate your your time this morning and thank you to all of you who've been joining us. Um, it's been a great start to the, to the day. Thank you.